Good morning, everybody. Gosh, what a big crowd. Um, thanks for a nice welcome, Sue, and thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze in. Usually I talk about delayed cold clamping, optimal cold clamping, and talk about the evidence. But this time I'm going to try and squeeze in 14 years of change in practice into 20 minutes, which is quite difficult. So if you hold on to your seats, um, like Sue said, it's Amanda Burley. It's now 30 years since I've been uh, a midwife. Uh, my name is Amanda Burley, been a midwife for 30 years, predominantly in the UK. Optimal core clumping is not a new thing. Um, Eras Erasmus Darwin and Ar Aristotle spoke about it in 300 BC to say that we shouldn't be, doing, we shouldn't be cutting the cord before it stopped pulsating. Erasmus Darwin said another thing very injurious to the child is the tying and cutting of the navel string too soon, which should always be left till the child has not only repeatedly breathed, but till all pulsation in the cord ceases, as otherwise the child is much weaker than it ought to have been, a portion of blood being left in the placenta, which ought to have been in the child. There is no evidence to say that cutting the cord before it stopped pulsating is safe. And I just want to get this in. We've moved from immediate cord clamping to delayed cord clamping of one minute. We have no evidence to say that one minute is OK. Judith Mercer recommends five minutes. So that if that's the only message you take home, that would be really good. So my light bulb moment was in 2005. I'd been a midwife for 16 years and I'd been happily cutting and clamping cords immediately because that's the way I was taught. And the other thing, especially for the students and what Mary said, is that you reflect and you look at everything that you do to make sure that it's evidence-based because I was quite happy to accept this instruction and I would have continued doing it if it hadn't have been for my two boys. I've got two boys, Sam and Max. They've both got ADHD. I'm not saying immediate cord clamping causes ADHD, but I certainly don't think it helps. It causes immediate um, iron deficiency anemia, which we know impacts on learning and behaviour. And the reason I uh, came to this conclusion is because, because my two children had needs, I was involved with teachers at two different schools, and all the teachers said, we've got lots and lots of children, especially the older teachers that have problems that we didn't have in the olden days. We had behavioural problems and learning problems, particularly males. And interestingly, the information and the evidence now proves that immediate core clamping which causes iron deficiency anemia, impacts on males more than it does females. We don't know why. So, I'd noticed this with a lot of children, and I'd looked at lots of different things to see what the common denominator was. Uh, there was six, we had six job share midwives, we had 14 children between us, five girls and nine boys, and seven of the boys had learning problems. So it got me to look at lots of different things, and that's why eventually when I, I reflected on the evidence and my own practice as a midwife, I realised there was no evidence for immediate core clamping. I looked on the internet and found George Morley's document. That he'd done a lot of articles and experiment, um, research on immediate core clamping, and he said that the core clamp was the most dangerous thing that had ever been invented, and that the core clamp injures your baby, causing cerebral palsy, learning disorders and mental deficiency respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. So that is all I'm going to talk about with delayed core clamping, really, because then I realised that because we were supposed to do evidence-based practice, we needed to change from doing immediate core clamping, which was very common right across the developed world, to delayed core clamping. So I set about making change happen, thinking it would be easy. Jenny the M, Mrs. Skin to Skin, did this poster for me, because she had very similar experiences with um, trying to get skin to skin in and I learned very quickly that the most dangerous phase in the language is we've always done it this way and people didn't want to change practice at all there was every excuse under the book at that time we didn't do much quality improvement methodology because it was 2005 and it's only in recent years that's become really really important but in an ad hoc way and in retrospect this is what I did so I did audits in 2010, which showed that babies at the hospital I worked at had 20, 75% of babies had the core cut immediately before they breathed. And then I did, after implementing practice, uh, we did parent audits and case studies, presentations, talking to consultants and midwives and doctors, informing and involving parents who were very, very good at taking on board the information and the evidence and changing they were, and requesting, because parents are actually the biggest change activists, because if they know what's best for their baby, they will ask for this. And they were really fundamental in changing the practice of immediate core clamping to delayed core clamping. We, we've got a lot more work to do. Um, they became campaigners and researchers in their own right, especially I had a lot of women and fathers from different countries, Eastern European, who went back and looked at practice in their own country. 
uh, involved in local and national newspaper articles, writing articles for the AIMS, BJM, and co-authoring co with consultants. And I was very, very lucky to be involved in a network and de delay call clamping steering group compiled of consultants who were extremely inclusive with me being the only midwife. And we developed a basic trolley, a resuscitator, which is a mini resuscitator that means that the baby can have intact cord resuscitation um, and get the benefits of both resuscitation and having an intact cord. Uh, we developed this in 2010 because we realised that babies that were more likely to get immediate core clamping were the babies that were compromised or premature, but they were the babies that benefited more from intact cord resuscitation. Uh, and this went into production. It was developed and it's gone into production and it's been sold worldwide. In fact, there's still the prototypes now of this trolley. We called it a basics trolley because it was a bedside assessment, stabilisation and initial cardiorespiratory support but they changed the name to Lifestart because basic sounds like it came from Tesco's. <laughs> and we won an award in 2011 and it was really, you know, it was, it was a fantastic do and it was really nice to be included by all the consultants. I managed to get a subtle change in the uh, delay core comping guidelines at the hospital. Bear in mind, I've always been a band six midwife and there was quite a lot of suspicion, but we did manage to get this change and it was active management, early clamping of the cord, uh, and then this was added, however, there is increasing evidence to support neonatal outcomes by delaying clamping of the cord, perhaps for as long as two minutes. This particularly applies to preterm infants. NICE guidance is under review. NICE guidance was recommended immediate cord clamping until they changed in late 2014, and they were the crux to change in practice as well. However, in the meantime, it's suggested that in a well-term baby, clamping of the cord should be delayed until after the baby has taken its first breath which is um, interesting. And then, because I'd been successful in doing this, I was taken into the office and asked to be quiet about delay core clamping because women in my care as a community midwife were asking for delay core clamping with cesarean sections and the doctors were banging on the door saying, who is this midwife? Um, it did cause quite a few problems. I did win midwife of the year 2012 with an award for work which will count, help countless babies. And by this time, uh, there was a, a division between what I was doing and what the managers and people, because obviously I was stepping out outside my box as a band six midwife. Uh, and this was, uh, this was the most exciting thing that happened to me. It was a really family affair, and um, it was great. Three days after I won the award, I, came, I found a laminated email from the clinical director at the hospital that was working that said he'd had a very helpful discussion with the midwifery, midwifery managers who agreed that the formal process for time planning plan timing of cord clamping in term and preterm babies was not clear to all staff. And so there was a potential for confusion and a risk to babies. So they suspended delayed cord clamping. All babies would have immediate cord clamping from that day onwards. And if parents asked for delayed cord clamping, because I had a discussion with them, they were to be told it wasn't recommended. So this is despite the evidence. And this went into place for 14 months, which is apparently 12,000 babies. And it took a really strong consultant to change practice round again. The managers set up their own delayed core clamping steering group, but I was not invited to be on that steering group. So I found that the quality improvement methodology, despite evidence-based practice, didn't work. You can imagine I was devastated <laughs> <laughs> because I was a, a midwife for the mission. And because I'd been excluded, I think everybody's human, and you would have felt the same as me. <clears throat> and I thought, I can either be quiet, or <laughs> I can get back into my box or I could get louder. So what would you have done? What are the students of tomorrow are going to be doing? Um, I started rigorously campaigning. The first thing I did, because I realised that NICE guidance was, um, they weren't going to change guidance, this was 2012, they weren't going to change their guidance in the end of 2014, which was nearly three years. So I set up a campaign to, to, and petitioned NICE to stop immediate core clamping immediately, which ran for a year and was signed by 5,500 people in 44 different countries. So I wasn't on my own in the thinking. I set up a Facebook page which was called Optimal Core Clamping Wait for White, and that's now got over 26,000 likers, and we share information that goes around the world, and anybody can participate in that. And I had a Daily, a daily Mail article, Amanda Burley, and I was described as a midwife with a mission. My friends were horrified that it was in the Daily Mail and they were asking if it was online because they thought they'd have to put, go to the shops with a paper bag on their heads. But, but even the Daily Mail, you know, if you pick your journalists well, you can get really good journalists and they work with you to get good article and they've been quite good. So, 
So implementing evidence into practice, um, into action. Every opportunity I get to speak at Optimal, about optimal core clamping, I will take up. And I do travel the country, and I've spoken at least 35 national conferences and numerous parent events as well. It's really exciting because you get asked to speak in other countries, and I've been to Istanbul, uh, Tunisia, Adelaide, Australia, and recently Lusaka in Zambia. Written numerous articles, academic and otherwise, a book chapter for an Australian-UK collaboration which is just coming out. Completed my degree, because I was one of those old-star midwives that we trained and we didn't do a degree, so I only got my degree two years ago, and now I'm gone on to further education. I had to wait till the kids had grown up, because, um, yeah. <laughs> I think people with better kids, I don't know how you midwives do it, the ones that have got children and are actually doing midwifery degree, I really take my hats off to you. So. And uh, collaborated with and assisted student midwives, doctors, parents and other activists in the UK and globally, written two modules, modules and a key speaker in a German birth film. Optimal core clamping, this is, the, this is a global campaign, Optimal core clamping, Wait for White, which is a global campaign and it started years ago, because been, I've been doing this 14 years ago, 14 years now. And it's a very good visual of leaving a cord until it's finished the process it was intended to do. This is a midwife in New York that did this um, artwork for us, and that's Wait for Right, and shows it's clamping the cord clamping down over five minutes. And when I first saw this in 2005, all guidelines recommended immediate core clamping and the World Health Organization changed in 2007 and they now recommend the first embrace, which is skin to skin and leaving the cord until it stopped pulsating. World Health, um, Royal College of Gynecologists changed their guidance in 2009 to recommend delayed core clamping. Royal College of Midwives in 2012. And then NICE guidelines changed in 2014. I say hallelujah because I've just explained why. They, only, they changed it to uh, one to five minutes, which everybody said was disappointing because one minute, but at least it made people think about the practice. But one minute is not delayed core clamping. It is still early core clamping. And this is a big crux because people think that one minute is delayed core clamping, but the baby, we know this, loses a lot of their iron deficiency, their, their iron rich blood and a million stem cells. And it particularly comes into the fore with the core blood companies who are now... Um, trying to get mums and dads and parents to give up their baby's core blood. And we know one hospital where one of the public banks is actually on the delivery suite and they are asking women in labour if their baby can, they can have the core blood. This is not informed choice. This is coercion. And it isn't, how can you tell somebody in labour that, you know, we'd like to take your baby's blood, we clamp after one minute, they don't tell them about the research that shows decreased myelin in brain, a cause that are clamped earlier than three minutes, and they don't tell them about the end deficiency anemia and what impact that can have on your child's learning and behaviour. If parents knew this, they wouldn't be doing it. It's big money. The government thinks it's OK for NHS hospitals to make money out of cold blood peop, um, bank uh, companies. As midwives, this puts us in great risk because if it does come out that we're doing things wrong, we're the people that are advising the women that are having babies. So please take that away with you as well and do your research. I can't go and sit too much now, but there's lots out there. So, big breakthrough. Changing NICE guidelines in 2014, and I was actually credited with changing the guidelines, which I didn't. There were some far more important people who changed the guidelines. Tracy Cooper's one of them. But it did make a big song and dance about it, and it was really, really good, because any publicity, any winning of awards, any newspaper articles actually um, publicises delayed optimal core clamping. And I did get Midwife of the Year in 2015, which was success by Midwife to Influence Change. And work had told me to be quiet. Well, you can imagine they were really, really impressed by this. <laughs> because it went mental. And I was in the Yorkshire Union Post, the Daily Mail online. I was interviewed for the Daily Mail, in Telegraph interview online. Sunday to Mail and Telegraph, the Mirror of the Sun, Radio Air, Screensaver for Google, CNN interview, Sydney News, Nigerian News, Turkish News and Sky News. The kids thought it was hilarious because people were ringing up saying, your mother's on Google. What's she doing on Google? <laughs> My auntie, my auntie Susan was in bed one morning and I came on Sky News. She said she nearly fell out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> but you can imagine work were absolutely horrified. I thought it was really, really funny. I really enjoyed it, actually. And that, I don't know, does everybody know about Amy Tutor in America? She's the sceptical ob. There's, a, a, camp, uh, there's um, a petition at the moment to get her off. She makes Katie Hopkins look like a choir girl. And she hates midwives. And I got an Amy Tutor badge of, badge of fame, which I wear with pride. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'll talk about the positives of being a change activist. There are lots of negatives, which I might briefly touch on. 
but I've been involved in a German film, being on TV. I was on the RCM for a little while. I was invited on to the RCM because I was a campaigner. I was also investigated for being a campaigner, and I'm no longer a member of the RCM. <laughs> Uh, we invented the basics trolley. We get lovely emails from people. This midwife wrote and said, ah, bless, I feel well privileged, LOL. I'm well chuffed with delayed call clamping. I haven't, I've never seen anything like it. It was physically pumping. Kiss, 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 kiss. You meet really nice people. We've got Michelle O'Donnell there and Tara Pauly, who's a great researcher and a fabulous midwife, and I were on the same bill, and we just couldn't believe it. Um, and people send you things like registration numbers, plates. Who? So in between the two, people say, you know, it's a, a long road to success. And I wouldn't say it is success, really. I think it's, a, it's like a roller coaster ride, really. You have successes and failures. Um, and that is, change, that is change management. And you just have to duck and dive, really. There's no straight path. You do duck and dive. And I've had successes, but I've also had failures as well. And it's just about keeping resilient and keeping on and trying to get people on board. And what you see is the tip of the iceberg. I'll stand up here and talk, and I'll talk to anybody about optimal core clamping. But the way you do, you have bulging emails, you lobby people and lobby MPs, speak to health ministers in different countries, travel a lot to try and get people to change. K2 were very successful because K2 actually recommend on their programme that you do immediate core clamping to sedate blood gases. You don't take immediate core clamping to do blood gases. You can do blood gases on an intact cord. And when I wrote to them and I said, actually, you, you're not providing evidence-based care, they put a clause in to say that it's recommended, that, you know, nice recommend one minute. So you can have little successes as well. And they're looking at the evidence with, with changing that. Uh, we work with the ambulance people. We've got a new campaign, no more shoelaces, because of the call centres tell you to t tell the parents to tie off the cord with the shoelace. There's no evidence base whatsoever in that at all. And parents, instead of making sure the baby's warm and that mum's OK, are running around looking for a mucky shoelace. It's not evidence based. Um, I do recommend for anybody to look at the School for Healthcare Radicals, which was run by Helen Bevan and NHS IQ. It's really, really good. And I realised when I was reading that, that although I'd done this ad hoc methodology, that I was actually following a process uh, loosely. Um, but it showed that there are boat rockers and troublemakers. And I realised that I was a boat rocker. I'd been pushed to being a bit of a trouble causer. But actually, we need boat rockers, particularly in midwifery. We have to have a very strong voice. We're walking a fine line at the moment. We need strong people to stand up and change practice and say that we're a force to be reckoned with. <clears throat> so what's next? Since 2014, the NICE guidelines, there's been lots of movement, but not enough. Millie Hill did a, um, a survey in three, uh, 2017 that showed 20% of babies are still having immediate core clamping. Um, that was 3,500 parents, so it wasn't a small study. And babies, are, and parents are still not being listened to. 40% of the parents that answered this survey said the cord was cut before they wanted it to be cut. Parents need effective informed choice, which is absolutely paramount. We know the evidence, they need to know the evidence, and we use, need to use this evidence to inform our practice. Keep going. We need everybody to jump on board, so if we've got any budding people out there that want to do research, we need lots more research, we need lots more campaigning, we need lots of more articles, more websites, and we'll continue the optimal cord clamping Wait for White global campaign. There's other people doing really good things. Hannah Tizar's done Blood to Baby. She's got lots of information on there. You have to log in and register for it, but she's got lots of stuff. Cord blood banking, parents are not informed of the latest research, which I've said before. That is a big one, and that is we need to campaign strongly for that, and we need to get people to know what's happening. The other thing I'll say about midwifery culture is it can be really hard. So if you see tall poppies and activists doing it, help them up. And if you are a tall poppy and activist, join forces with other tall poppies and activists. Because like, I don't, I'm not saying which one I am, but Frank Zappa says, <laughs> without deviations from the norm, progress is not possible. Because I got quite a lot of hammering, um, I set up um, a Say No to Bullying in Midwifery Facebook page. Another non-midwife came on board, Danny Griffiths, and we set up a group. Um, we started it in April 2014 and we, 2017, and by the two months we had over 2,000 members. And bullying culture in midwifery, for whatever reason, is really quite poor, and there are some awful stories coming out, and there's a lot of students that are struggling as well. Join the page. We can't do anything structurally, but we can support you. We can put you in touch with other people. We can post anonymous posts. 
that we can go out there, I'm not the font of all knowledge, but you can go out there and lots and lots of people, members, will join and give you advice and solidarity and unity to how to get through these. We do do some structural thing because we've had one university where the same person's name kept coming up. And as the owner of that group, I had a responsibility to pass that information on and it was taken seriously. And that's all I did, I passed it on, they're dealing with it. So, you know, things do get changed because of it, but we have to change this because we're losing midwives hand over fist. And a lot of campaigners are actually no working, longer working as clinical midwives because of what's happened to them, and I'm actually one of them. Um, but we need to stick together. I'm still obviously a midwife and still talking, so um, just keep going and join us. That's the end of my presentation. My contact details are there. If anybody wants any information about um, optimal core clamping or wants to join the bullying page on Facebook, we do ask questions, but we don't use the questions. We don't use the answers because some people worry about um, putting their trust and things. It's just to make sure that you, we've had a few voyeurs come into the group. We just want to make sure that we're getting genuine people in to protect the safety of the people that are in the group. And to protect the safety, if anybody's got anything they want to say, they can come through me anonymously. And I think that's it. So thank you.